Uh, first off, a uh, question about the power grid. How serious is the threat? We kind of got a sense of that earlier. Uh, how serious is the threat of an attack on our power grid and what specifically is being done? Well, I thought I tried to cover that. Uh, I think it's quite serious. I think North Korea and Iran both have the potential um, with uh, nuclear weapons. I, I personally believe that we're foolish if we don't at least consider it likely that Iran already has nuclear weapons. They work hand in hand with North Korea. They're present at the tests there. And it's generally acknowledged now, I think, that North Korea has nuclear weapons, just not clear uh, what the specific design is and how many they have. So it's possible that they can deliver them that way. It's also possible in the case of Iran that they could work with ISIS, even though ISIS is a, uh, a Sunni uh, a terrorist group, jihadi group. Um, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend applies in this case, I believe. And um, the Shia Iranian leadership would just as soon see, you know, the great Satan America destroyed as the great, uh, the little Satan Israel. So I think the threat is real. Uh, I think it will take time to, um, to deal, to prepare to deal with it. How much time? I, I, you know, if, if Diane and uh, Stacy do this again, maybe next year I can tell you uh, a good estimate of that. I'm very hopeful that the work I mentioned to you we're starting with Duke Energy will enable us to really specify how to go about doing this uh, hardening of the grid and protection of the grid, how to restore uh, it if in, in fact is taken down. Um, but I don't have a good estimate of how long that will take. Thanks. A couple of questions on the issue of HUD. And the question here is, what do you do if your city has already agreed to take HUD money and has used some of that HUD money? Don't take any more. <laughs> uh, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. Once you, once you, it depends on where you are in the process. I mean, uh, this new AFFH rule that I was referring to, uh, actually, the first applications under that format are due after October of this year. So it's very possible that your, your community has taken money under the old AI, uh, Assessment of Impediments. Um, that does not mean that HUD can't hold you to that. Um, I wish I really had a good answer. You know, I, wish, I wish I had one you wanted to hear. There's a good chance that right now, because it's an election year, because this is such an egregious attack on, on property rights, and HUD knows what it is, they kept it under the uh, they kept it under the radar a lot. Either way, it was rolled out. They they kept it almost a secret for a year and a half before they before they released the ruling, and they released the ruling by the way on December 21st uh, of 2014, uh, right after after Congress had gone home. So they basically got no coverage at all. Uh, so there is a chance that if you've accepted HUD money right now, uh, just you, you might be okay on it. But don't take any going forward. You, you really have to cut the line on this thing. Uh, Westchester County doesn't take HUD money anymore. There's uh, Castle Rock, uh, uh, Colorado out there. They stopped taking HUD money. There's a couple of towns in, in New Hampshire that have stopped, and a lot more are stopping. So. Just, we, we have to learn to live on what we have. And it's kind of an old, weird concept, but generally you can't spend any more money than you have in the bank. So uh, our communities have to get back to doing that same thing. The second follow-up question to that, by the way, is uh, about the value of pushing back. Is it worth it to push back? To push back, who asked that? To push back to whom? You push back against HUD? Push back against your, your public officials for taking the money? Where, where were you? What was your thought? Both. Both. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say uh, 
your chances of being able to push back against HUD, it, in reality right now, like, you'd have to override a presidential veto. You'd have to get both sides of Congress to, uh, to, to pass a, a new regulation overriding uh, the AFFH rule, uh, Affirmative Furthering Fair Housing, and then they'd have to be prepared to override a presidential veto. So that's, that's the way you push back. Uh, however, that said, there, there's a Gosser bill and a Gosser amendment. This is, this is on the radar. There's also another bill in the, in the Senate that's been sponsored. Uh, I think the House has about 23 different sponsors on it. It's, it's, it's laying there. It's not going anywhere. Uh, but this is aware. So I would certainly you know, do all that Bill's uh, Center for Self-Governance uh, activities there and, and develop a strategy to, to try to work with, you, work with your congressman to stop that. As far as local officials are concerned, I'll tell you what's been very successful working with the municipal attorneys and the advisors to your uh, public officials. If you have a, a group of public officials and one stands up and says, you know what, we shouldn't take this HUD money. But meanwhile, you're talking about $2 million, $4 million, $6 million. And the other, the other uh, commissioners are saying to themselves, well, you know, there's too much in this for us. And, and we're going to look good if we do take the money. It's going to be hard to get them to stop. But if your municipal attorney stands up and says, if you take this money, you're liable to get sued and you don't really have the money to afford that lawsuit, and you may have to raise taxes, that pretty much makes it toxic. So the one way that we've been able to stop these is by just pointing out how toxic the money is and then, then developing a network. I think earlier, uh, when I was giving my presentation, I talked about the uh, uh, Property Value Defense Network. And this is a network that I created oh, a couple of months ago. And it's attorneys and public officials around the country, each one communicating with the other, saying, oh my god, this is what's in the bill. I don't think you knew about it. That's the key to stopping this. Municipal attorneys advising the commissioners. Question on refugees. I believe this will be for Jim. Uh, where are the Christians? We have so many uh, refugees coming. Where are the Christians among them? They're not with the refugees. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. They, they uh, have fled in many cases the towns that they've lived in. You know, in, in, in Iraq, they've fled many of the, uh, uh, um, the cities where they lived for you know, thousands of years, really. And uh, uh, I think some have taken refuge uh, in, in, in various uh, strongholds that some of our allies have set up there. But honestly, I don't know the answer to that question. I do know that they are not being resettled as refugees. And they are the really the Christians and the Yazidis, people like that. Those are the true refugees. Those are the people who really are seriously being oppressed. They're the ones who are being beheaded by ISIS. You know, they're not be ISIS is not beheading fellow Sunni Muslims, at least not in any great numbers. A question here for the ambassador. If we uh, put missile defense systems in the Gulf, will it destroy a missile before it detonates uh, only from a ship or a sub? It depends on the, um, on the effectiveness of the defense. Uh, if we deploy the Aegis Ashore sites that we're putting into Romania in their current um, condition, it would work best against... Um, um, ship-based attacking missiles. But I would remind people that in 2008, I believe it was, we used an Aegis interceptor to shoot down a satellite, uh, which was at the time dying, an NSA uh, bird that had on it fuel that was toxic. And President Bush, in looking at the missile defense capabilities that he had, picked the Aegis system as the preferred system to use in shooting down that satellite. So the systems are inherently capable of performing the intercept if they have the sensor information to provide uh, tracking to aim and, uh, and actually select the target. So um, I would argue that uh, depending on what else we do, the sites around the Gulf of Mexico could protect us against satellite launch as well. I, I would say, moreover, the, uh, we have four interceptors today at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, which if we had forward base sensors in the Philippines, say, uh, they could protect us against satellites launched out of, uh, out of North Korea. Iran's a, more, a bit more difficult. Uh, if the crews, crews were trained on our Aegis ships and they were close to the launch site, 
in Iran, uh, they have the ability to shoot down a satellite launcher as it goes up. Um, these are air defense interceptors. Uh, when missiles are initially launched, they're not going very fast, and those, um, those interceptors are quite capable to shoot down uh, the rockets while they're still burning. But they have to be close, and the crews have to be trained, and it would require probably software changes. So as I said in my talk, there's no real invention required to do any of this. Um, it just, uh, what is required is the will and um, the directive from the appropriate authorities to tell our engineers to go do it. Just a matter of deployment is what it comes down to. Um, uh, I'm not sure who would best answer this question. This is about, again, technology, the ability to secure mass polling. What keeps us from designing a system to encourage everyone to vote on public issues? Um, I guess kind of more of an instant uh, response. Anybody in particular want to touch on this? Uh, maybe Gary, you want to jump in on this one? You know, uh, I'll say something about it because I've studied vote fraud uh, pretty extensively and written about it. A lot of the automated voting systems are so uh, vulnerable to vote fraud. You know, a lot of uh, the voting advocates want to automate voter registration and make everything so that you can do it all on the internet. And I got to tell you, that's insane. You don't know who is signing up. You don't know who's registering. You don't know anything about them. And don't tell me that the government is going to bother to go through the effort to figure out when somebody <laughs> signs up on the internet, oh, no, he's not really a US citizen. Yeah, sure. And then they're going to show up with the FBI at his door and carry him off. Right. So uh, strongly discourage any type of automatic voting, automated internet uh, registration or voting or anything like that. That's just a, a recipe for massive vote fraud, which is, frankly, uh, the reason that so many voting advocates are pushing it. One of the things that I have found is that the uh, uh, whole issue of uh, technology has been very beneficial as far as communication wise and concerned and getting feedback. And I think that's one of the things that you're talking about here is that uh, that feedback uh, from people that allows me to take and get uh, a message out to uh, thousands of people at one time. It also allows uh, me to get feedback uh, from those people at, uh, at one time also, which is very helpful, particularly when you have an issue that uh, is, is right there in front of you, you've got to take and uh, deal with that you may want to have some feedback from. So I think from those, those instances and those cases have been very helpful. That's not voting. As opposed to voting, and you're making a distinction there of getting opinion as opposed to, to actual voting on something. I think the ambassador wanted to, to jump in on that I want well. I, I want to correct something I said. I said the NSA. I really meant the, uh, the National Reconnaissance Office, the NRO. Okay. Uh, they were the ones who had the bird that, that had toxic fuel on board. It's interesting, you know, back when I was involved in overseeing uh, some of their programs, you couldn't even mention the word NRO because it, it itself was a classified term. That's not the case anymore, thankfully. Thanks. Appreciate that, sir. Uh, and this is a, a question I know a lot of people have been raising. Uh, uh, Bill, we were having this conversation a few minutes ago about the area of uh, engagement. How many people is it going to take, uh, what point, critical mass, to really make a difference? <laughs> yeah. It takes far fewer uh, people then you know. Uh, uh, Stacy read the quote from Margaret Mead that it, you know, never uh, lose sight of the fact that a, a few dedicated people can have great impact. In fact, that's all that ever have. In our American Revolution, about 3% of the population was actually engaged in the revolution, much, much smaller than the average person would imagine involved in that. Um, in a given community where we are most local, uh, one person can have dramatic impact on that community if they understand an issue and they, they understand social relations involving strategy to achieve uh, control or to gain authority. Um, in a county of maybe 500,000 people, you can have tremendous impact with four or five people. Uh, 
At a state level, you need uh, some multiple of that, uh, probably fewer than 100 individuals. Uh, in Tennessee, uh, probably about 10 people, and in a couple of cases, uh, fewer than five to have tremendous impact on a state. But it begins much earlier than when the issue is coming to a vote. We're being trained every day that the time to have an impact, I mean, all the, the communications you get from all of the organizations around the country, oh, they're going to vote tomorrow, quick, send email. Um, by the time a vote has been scheduled, whether it be in committee or whether it be at, before the full floor, 99.9% .9 of, of the negotiations and, and the decisions have been made. It's way too late. Uh, Diane gave several examples in South Carolina of the investment of time in social relations way early, before they even had a sense of what the issues might evolve to be, that set the framework and the groundwork to be able to have influence at a time when it's critical. So um, as far as numbers, it doesn't take nearly the numbers that we have been brainwashed to believe. We believe we need 100 million, 150 million people. We do not. Um, I used the statistic when I talked earlier that even uh, if you accept the term democracy, which I do not, we are a republic, but it is a majority that wins an election. We are a representative democracy in the sense of the manner in which we conduct an election. So we think it's majority rule, but it's not. It's a majority of those who participate. So you take the total population, then you reduce it by those who register to vote, then you reduce it by those that do vote, then you get half of that, and add one to get your majority, when you distill it all down, it's between six and 7%. Um, and yet we think, you know, it's more than half. So uh, self-governing is much easier than we think, but it takes habit and long training, as you displayed in your quote. Excellent. Back to the issue of the grid. Is there any legislation pending right now to protect South Carolina's grid? Is there a state that's actually doing this where we can follow their example? Um, two states uh, have actually passed legislation. Uh, one is Maine. They were the first, uh, interestingly enough, led by a Democrat. And, and I would argue uh, throughout our activities, we've uh, tried very hard not to get into any partisan uh, discussion of this because this is a, uh, a threat to us all. Uh, but um, a lady who, uh, her name is Bolin, uh, and, um, Andrea Bolin, who was a state legislator there, learned about this issue and got a burr under her saddle, and going back to the point one person can make a difference. And she was able to persuade uh, the majority to pass legislation that led to a study, and then we ran in, she ran into a headwind from the energy companies uh, that have blocked any serious action. This was three years ago uh, in the state of Maine. In Virginia, Scott can take credit for uh, persuading Bryce Reeves uh, when he ran against a 30-year incumbent uh, Democrat and was successful in winning, and Scott worked with him on campaign and pestered him, pestered him about EMP. And uh, Bryce uh, was able to get legislation in the state of Virginia passed, and Virginia is actually working this issue. Dominion Electric, which is uh, one, of the, one of the larger companies in, uh, the, in the nation and, and uh, has uh, great influence in Virginia, and Virginia is working the problem seriously, no doubt, because Norfolk and other military posts in the state have uh, citizenry who understand some of these issues, and they, their voices are heard in, the, in not only the uh, public debate, but in the private councils of government. And as best I understand it, um, they're making serious progress. I would hope that what we're going to do with Duke Energy uh, um, is integrated into that world. But those, there are several other states that are in various stages of trying to pass legislation. Last year, there were several legislators here who offered to do that in South Carolina, and I persuaded them not 
I guess I persuaded them because no one did it, uh, not to do that because I wanted to try to work the problem as we are working it inside. Um, they're running into a little bit of difficulty in North Carolina right now. I have to be careful how I say this. The lieutenant governor there directed that they study this issue and uh, we will figure out how to integrate with that too. But downward directed instruction to an organization that isn't prepared to move um, is easy to manipulate by those people who don't want to do anything than if you're able to work the problem from the bottom up. And, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this. Uh, I also should mention that Joe Wilson, who is a representative from, I forget what district it is, but in Aiken, uh, South Carolina and Columbia is included in his district. He chairs the Emerging Threats Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee. And he is on board wanting to do this and has offered to me personally that when we're ready to move on this, he will take initiatives to rattle some cages on our behalf. So I believe that we're prepared here within the state and at the right time, I'd like to see legislation that empowers the adjutant general to make this happen overall in the state, but we're not quite ready yet. All right, terrific, terrific. Um, the question about uh, budget, and this is a uh, um, question about balancing the budget, and yet at the same time, uh, recognizing our presentation we heard earlier about the fact that our pension is being uh, shortchanged. How is this um, process accomplished without shortchanging uh, our pension fund. How how do we handle that? Well, we got to keep in mind the uh, the pension fund is uh, something that uh, is 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 handled not only through uh, state uh, revenue but also through uh, uh, what we actually charge back to the uh, employees, and a lot of the, that comes back from uh, uh, from them. And uh, how do you go about addressing that uh, in a way that doesn't put such a big burden upon the employees uh, of the state that uh, we're looking at giving a 1% raise to this year and didn't give anything to the year before uh, without uh, uh, putting them into poverty and on the uh, uh, welfare roll. So that's been a big balancing act for us. Uh, and it's been, a, it, it's, it's been one of the reasons that there has been so much nipping at the edges in trying to address the issue uh, because uh, of not wanting to really to take to uh, uh, and, and put the employees of the state in uh, any sort of a financial bind themselves. Since we have you on the spot here as well, someone asking the question about the the allocated $130 million for roads. How much of this is allocated to road repair? Do we have a breakdown of that? Of the $130 million? It mentions 130 That figure's actually higher, isn't it? It, it is. It, when you look at it, it's probably going to be more like 430 But the $130 million was what was put in for uh, uh, the uh, uh, tax reductions that will probably move over into the, uh, the roads to take and cover that. And um, we're looking at uh, $65 million of that uh, that we're putting into the trust fund that will go to taking fund overall roads. We're looking at about 250 million that will go to the C funds, uh, which will be a, a directly uh, funded and funding your secondary roads that do not get federal match dollars, which is where we have the biggest problem uh, with the, uh, the road maintenance in the state and where we also see the biggest impact because in a county like Greenville County, where you've got a, a, a C funds committee, that has its own engineers and so forth and taking move on those projects pretty quickly you're able to see those dollars go into effect very quickly also there was a study done by the uh, uh, the state newspaper that says that uh, uh, a lot of those uh, 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 monies that we put into with the uh, c funds uh, last committees uh, last year uh, they're nowhere near getting ready but uh, a lot of those in some of the smaller rural counties that really aren't equipped to handle those those sorts of dollars either uh, so uh, it, it will, that will be going directly toward it. There will be, uh, I, I think we've got uh, budgeted in the House Ways and Means budget of $50 million that will go toward the uh, state infrastructure bank that will allow them to take and leverage those uh, for, uh, I think uh, last year they were able to take and lever leverage that for $650 million. Part of that went to the I-85, 385 interchange. So those are all go toward larger projects. Uh, bigger uh, needs on your interstates and things like uh, that. So, um, does that answer the question? 
I, well, the question was about specifically about how much will be used to repair roads as opposed to perhaps doing new projects. Do you have a sense of how much will, will go into repair? It will all go toward it, but some of that will go toward engineering and other things like that, and road wide away things. The $250 million for the resurfacing and the sea funds, all of that will pretty well go toward. Some will be toward uh, uh, toward uh, uh, engineering and a little bit toward right of ways because you, you, one of the things that you will try do on some of these secondary roads, or what you'll have to do under the new standards, you'll have to take and widen it by putting additional shoulders onto the roads because the, the width of the roads standards now are much larger than uh, th when those roads were actually developed to begin with. Uh, and you, you add another two feet to the, uh, to the, uh, the width of the road, uh, it, it exponentially uh, it makes the roads so much more safer for people to drive on. One final question, uh, volunteer on this, uh, about the Republican convention representing Greenville. This person is saying, you know, they, we, they appreciate the planks for the platform, and yet at the same time, the state seems to cut off the microphone in terms of listening to people. How, what do you do? What do you do about that? And I guess not having the opportunity to be heard at the convention. <laughs> <laughs> continue to take and speak and continue to take and keep your voice out there. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, not really rocket science. Just persistence <laughs> it's, is, what, it's is persistent. what you're yeah. suggesting here. Uh, if you first you don't succeed, continue to take and uh, do so. Uh, it, it, continue to take and be in case. Uh, too often we do give up and then quit, as you said earlier. And we can't do that. We can't let them win that way. We got to continue to take and to, uh, to go. We got to continue to take and to speak. And there's been many times that uh, uh, I have taken ideas and issues and threw them out there on the table, knowing that they weren't going to go anywhere. But at least you get it out there. You get the discussion started. You at least plant a seed. And if you continue to take and, and work on it, you continue to take and push for it, eventually we'll get something done. Uh, even if it's not all that you want to want to get done, and as you said earlier, you got to be patient also, and not forget the end goal. But just as we have done with a lot of our pro-life legislation, we know the end goal that we want to try and reach. We know where we're headed. We know how we're going to get there, and we take take taking another bite out of the uh, uh, the uh, elephant uh, on uh, each year until we actually get there. And uh, it's been a long, patient uh, journey, but we've made a lot of progress in doing that. You've got to continue to take and look at these things in that sort of respect. I have been in, in government uh, from the inside as a manager for a number of years, and one of the things that I learned very, on, uh, very early on was that government works a lot in incremental steps, and you've got to accept that. Unless there's something major that, uh, that changes or, or forces a, a major change, then it, it, it's not going to happen. Uh, when you have uh, major controversy, major issues, major uh, tragedies that take place, you can have major change that take place as, as a result of that. You have to be prepared for those opportunities to make that happen. The left is very good at that. As uh, Rahm Emanuel says, never let a, a tragedy go to waste. A, a crisis go to, go to waste. Mm -hmm. uh, we forget that a lot of times, but we also forget that that's not the way it normally works. The way it normally works is that you take a step, and then you take another step, and then you take another step, and you keep going until you get to the end of your destination. Absolutely. Ambassador, you wanted yeah. to chime in? Do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, another aspect of that is that we sometimes confuse the political parties, which are special interest groups in their own right, with the elected officials or the folks who are running for office. Um, so from the standpoint of the party system and the way that they conduct conventions, it's important that we do homework and understand what that process is and where the touch points for participation are. Uh, they vary uh, from state to state, and, and sometimes you'll see some variance within counties as to what procedure they're going to follow. But it's important to understand that the objectives of the political parties are not necessarily the same as the objectives of an individual candidate. And sometimes there's great discrepancy with regard to the intentions or the desire of the public. Um, in Virginia, uh, you're familiar with what happened with Eric Cantor. Uh, the, uh, Eric Cantor uh, helped his own uh, displacement, personal opinion, uh, by basically taking on the belief that he had grown bigger than real life. Um, 
the people didn't agree with that. So there was a the very strong feeling within his own district. Nonetheless, there was a very strategic set of actions taken in the participation of citizens in the way that political structure operated in Virginia. It's different here in South Carolina. But the first step is, for citizens who are concerned, learn the exact system that the political parties are using, be familiar with the procedures they'll follow, study what's been done before so that you know where your touch points are and how to exercise them. And then the second certainly is don't give up on short term. Build your social relations with those elected officials because they also work within the party and they can have influence. And, and don't just accept the fact that you're shut out. Um, that's, again, we tend to think that we are in an overthrow mode, that we are a democracy, that majority wins, and that the only way to solve the problem is to destroy the other side. It's not true at all. Uh, it's not how it was ever designed to work. So if we can understand what our objectives are, if we can engage personally, uh, if we can learn the systems and the strategies and the tactics that can be applied, if we learn how whatever that entity is that we're concerned about operates and use its systems, then we maximize our ability. And again, it's uh, the belief that it takes an entire state to overturn something like that or even a majority is not accurate. You need to know how to do it and then do it. Ambassador, you want to um, comment? On the going back to the question on legislature and that sort of thing, I was answering with respect to the states. There are a couple of things that are important to understand about what's going on in Washington. Uh, and since Diane's originally from Michigan, the fellow in, who chairs the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee is a fellow by the name of Fred Upton from Michigan. And he has blocked for two Congresses doing anything on the uh, on this issue. But this year, uh, I don't know what happened, but one of his staffers sent me a note with information of language that he was inserting not only in the uh, energy bill, but the transportation bill as well, which includes many of the provisions that we've been arguing to pursue, which he had blocked before. So persistence makes a difference somehow, and I can't tell you why or how in that case. And, and at least in conference this time, there's going to be uh, some positive things that will come out, I'm certain. Uh, I've met with uh, Senator Mikowski's uh, senior staff on the issues, and she's on board with helping. Um, there is also, she chairs the Senate, the Companion Senate uh, Energy uh, Bill uh, uh, Committee. And uh, there is also an initiative that has come out of the House, as I said in my talk, to, um, to um, um, direct the Department of Homeland Security to include EMP and other threats that, to the grid as, as one of the major scenarios that all the elements of government have to, to, um, to um, pre prepare for. And uh, the question now is whether or not the Senate is going to do something that's a companion or when they're going to do it. And that's up to Senator Ron Johnson. You can't, who chairs the um, Homeland Security Committee in the Senate, and you can't get around the politics on this. He's running for re-election against this Ron Feingold, and there are people are in Wisconsin who are saying, you know, Ron Johnson has tinfoil hats and whatever on this issue and so on. So. I'm hopeful that he's going to uh, put that aside. I know he is committed to working the problem, and that's why they're charging him with this sort of thing. Um, and I know he wants to do it, but that's something to watch in the coming weeks. Uh, the, the, um, those bills are, will be settled sometime probably within the next two months in Washington, and they're important to our progress. Excellent. It's good to hear that. Before we go, um one more question, since our resident journalist didn't get an opportunity to answer anything. I, I want to just ask you, how can people engage the material and, and that, you, that you are producing? And, uh, you know, th this is an important part of being an informed electorate. How can they stay engaged? 
Well, uh, it, it's a point of you're, you're talking about engagement and um, engaging le legislators. It only takes one person to change one person's mind. But when you're talking about um, really connecting and contacting with your, uh, your legislators, whether they be uh, at, the, at the national level or state level, House or Senate, um, it's important. I've got a chart above my, uh, above my desk taped on my uh, wall there of all the senators and House representatives' Twitter handles. Um, some are faster than others to, to access those things and get on there. Sometimes it's not them doing it, but their staffers. But that is a direct way to contact them. Uh, that is an easy way to keep pressure up. You can tweet as many times as you want to, and they get notifications, if you're like me, whenever somebody tweets at you in your little notifications bar. That's one way to do that. And also just to pay attention using uh, the hashtags of things that you're interested in to keep on top of any time that something like that is mentioned. You can put, if you have a particular senator you're interested in following, you can put a, a little search column up that has his hashtag with his uh, Twitter handle, and you'll see anything that comes up that's addressed to him. So that is an amazingly functional tool. I don't know that Twitter was originally designed for that, but in terms of journalism, it has become a, an invaluable resource for being able to connect with, follow, and stay on top of either issues or political individuals uh, to find out what's going on and to have impact, because a lot of times they will tweet you back, because that's much easier and faster to respond to a tweet and reply, look like you're engaged, uh, versus actually you know having a conversation or calling somebody back, and you can do it in real time. Uh, and then you can turn around and retweet that and post that, and that in turn will get a lot of other impact as well. So that was sort of be what I would uh, encourage people to do is just to be mindful about that uh, opportunity to engage that uh, platform, such as Twitter especially, uh, allows for uh, an informed citizenry. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your participation.